Thanks everyone for joining us today uh, for this webinar. Uh, today we're going to be presenting on keeping a handle on trading costs. So this is uh, part two of the multi-factor design, uh, but this is also the fourth webinar in a series of five that we've been doing around factor investing. And for those of you who uh, have uh, not been with us for the first few webinars, just to kind of recap of what we've done uh, already. So the first one, we covered what matters in multi-factor investing. Uh, the second one, we looked at some of the ignored risks of factor investing. And the third one was uh, on part one of the multi-factor design, where we looked at the construction uh, choices of mixing versus integrating. Uh, these are all available uh, on our website as replays. If you'd like to go and view them, please uh, jump onto our website and, and you can go see them. Uh, and in a couple of months' time, uh, we'll be producing uh, another uh, webinar, which is the final in the series on issues in ESG integration within factor strategies. If anyone uh, that's uh, dialed in uh, to listen to this webinar and doesn't receive our research, if you'd like to, uh, please go in to our website at researchaffiliates.com and you can register there on the homepage to receive our, our research going forward. Uh, and if you'd like to follow us via social media platforms, uh, you can do so on Twitter uh, and on LinkedIn. So I'd like to welcome back uh, Dr. Vitaly Kolesnik, uh, who has uh, presented on the, the previous three webinars uh, in this series. Uh, Vitaly is based with me in our London office, and uh, he uh, heads our European research efforts. Uh, Vitaly has been with the company for quite a long time, since 2006. Most of the time he's been based out in California, uh, recently moved over to London just over a year ago. And uh, if you look at some of our research, you'll see he's, he's a key contributor in much of the research that has been written around uh, factor investing. So just for everyone on the call today, uh, as a heads up, uh, the lines have been muted. So if you have questions as we're going through the webinar, please just submit those uh, through the Q&A box and we'll address them at the end. So just before I pass over to Vitaly, I'm quite excited about uh, this particular webinar because I don't think this topic really gets the attention that it deserves. Uh, and this is really important for investors uh, because if you invest into a poorly constructed strategy that has very high implementation costs, then a lot of that expected returns that, that, that you want to get out of that strategy get eroded away quite quickly, especially as it becomes uh, more popular. So uh, with that, you know, let me pass on to Vitaly. Thank you, Joe. And as the topic of the day's webinar is how to keep handle uh, on the transaction costs for index funds, uh, let me start with recapping some of the history of uh, indexing. Indexing started becoming more popular in the 70s and was pioneered largely uh, by veterans such as Jack Bogle. Uh, by the way, sadly, he passed away quite recently. Um, but and he contributed quite a bit to our industry. Uh, and so the popularity uh, of the uh, strategies uh, and the business reason for them was uh, multiple. Uh, basically, there was a growing evidence that uh, passive funds just beat active managers after we control for costs. Uh, and so low fees and transparency were very strong drivers uh, for adoption of uh, index funds. Uh, but also, uh, investors recognized the high liquidity and capacity of index funds, uh, the broad market participation, uh, and low turnover and pretty much non-existing trading costs uh, of the strategies. But is that last part true? Uh, do index funds have no trading costs? Uh, and zero turnover? Well, um, actually not so quickly. Uh, we've done uh, research, and so this slide that I'm showing here is based on uh, the work that I've done with uh, Rob Arnott and Lillian Wu. And, and here we're examining uh, the rebalancing for uh, popular uh, index funds. We've picked uh, S&P 500 uh, as it has trillions of dollars tracking it. Now, many investors believe that uh, cap-weighted funds uh, have close to zero turnover, and that's just not true. So uh, S&P 500, for example, uh, experiences uh, about 4.5% turnover on average one way per annum. 
Now, that's not zero. That's far from zero. Uh, further, stocks coming in and out of the portfolio tends to be at the bottom of this uh, of the CAP 500 list. So uh, as S&P 500 tries to uh, track uh, the largest uh, 500 companies by market capitalization, um, what it takes for index t- uh, to turn over is when stocks uh, grow f- uh, in rank uh, as price goes up, stocks get included. As price goes down, stocks get in- uh, excluded. And that's what we're showing in this chart. Uh, you can see that on average, uh, before uh, announcement, uh, the deletions go down in prices and additions go up in prices. Subsequent to the announcement, uh, you see further uh, move in prices in the same direction. So uh, red line goes down, the blue one goes up, This is the result of the buying and selling pressures as investors are getting ready uh, to the uh, rebalancing and then uh, the rebalancing uh, effect itself. So I want uh, this um, an important part, um, the uh, before uh, rebalancing, uh, exclusion and uh, deletions and additions in, into the index uh, experiencing, uh, are experiencing pricing pressure from the market. Uh, and after rebalancing, uh, these um, the prices tend to mean revert. So uh, net-net, uh, investors lose from this trade. So uh, in fact, we've uh, estimated uh, the amount by which they lose. So uh, deletions uh, on average of next year uh, beat additions by over 20%. Uh, and uh, when we estimate the hidden cost for the uh, S&P 500 uh, investors overall, uh, we get a number close to $19 billion in 2016 alone. That's pretty material, right? And uh, the worst part I- is uh, that these costs are not noticed. Uh, yet they're material and they're there even for the uh, large cap, very liquid indices. So this is a good segue into asking questions. So what are transaction costs experienced by uh, index implementers? Uh, and there are two types. Uh, there are explicit trading costs and implicit. And explicit are very easy. Uh, this is the difference that uh, in return between the fund return and the index paper portfolio. Uh, usually those explicit trading costs for good implementers tend to be tiny and investors think that uh, I'm experiencing zero transaction costs. But that's nothing but the truth often uh, because many indices Im- experience implicit trading costs. Uh, though, uh, and the transaction, uh, implicit transaction costs come from uh, the fact that mm, implementers trade uh, at the close and uh, they move the prices before uh, the index is calculated. And so when the index is calculated, uh, the price for whatever stock uh, index has bought uh, is high and the price uh, that index has bought is low. And that tends to mean revert uh, in the next few days or years. Mm, and these are the implicit trading costs. Just how big are these trading costs? We've taken a few uh, index uh, strategies uh, out there in the market for various factors. And uh, one of the benefit of indices is transparency. So uh, index providers publish their methodologies. We took these methodologies and replicated the strategies and then took a fairly sim- a few v- very simple transaction cost models which all produce uh, quite similar results. Here today we're looking just at one way of estimating transaction costs. Just how big are these transaction costs? So what you see on this slide is uh, that an average uh, fact, uh, factor strategy in this space has transaction cost in the tenth of basis point, uh, tens of basis points. Well, this is material. This tends to be larger than the uh, licensing fees and implementation costs uh, that you are paying to the uh, implementer and, uh, and the index provider. Uh, and then there are a few outliers. So uh, low vol strategy, dividend growth strategy, and a few momentum strategies here have transaction costs uh, on the order of hundreds of basis points. And that's larger than uh, the backtested alpha. So uh, right from bat, you know uh, that these strategies, which are potentially, and we will see later that potentially uh, they're poorly constructed in some way, uh, but uh, they could be... Um, they will not benefit investors because of these high transaction costs. 
So how did we come up with uh, these transaction cost estimates? Mm, so on this slide, uh, this is so the estimates that we produce are, are based on the uh, research done by my colleagues, uh, Mike Akid and uh, Max Moroz. And so what they did was they looked at the uh, index trade size as the percentage of average value volume and the corresponding market impact that they uh, were able to register. And you can see that there is a pretty much linear relationship here in the blue. So the larger the uh, average daily volume, uh, the percentage of daily volume consumed by index trades are, uh, the larger is the market impact. And uh, then in the few days uh, following that, in, in these green bars below, uh, you see that um, the same stocks tend to experience uh, similar in magnitude mean reversion. Um, so uh, the key takeaway from here is the more of the daily volume uh, that index rate consume, uh, the higher the transaction costs are going to be. So. This has a very interesting implication, direct implication, when uh, examining uh, various strategies. So we've seen before uh, that low volatility, high dividend, and, and momentum um, factors t uh, in the uh, two slides ago uh, had pretty high transaction costs. Well, when we are looking, let's say, at average turnover uh, of the strategies, what are the outliers? Well, the outliers are low volatility and momentum. Well, that high turnover means that you're consuming more of the daily volume and therefore the price impact is larger. Not surprising, the trading costs are larger. When you're looking at the middle uh, chart here, you see that low volatility and high dividend strategies tend to have a low weighted average market cap. So low weighted average market cap means that the, uh, the trades relative to the uh, average trade are going to be large and therefore the transaction costs are going to be high. Uh, and then finally, uh, the number of holdings. Uh, again, the blue and red bars show up quite low there. And so what that means is low vol and dividend portfolios are quite concentrated. And so each trade uh, then experienced by these strategies uh, automatically will uh, will be uh, larger as a percentage of daily volume and therefore the transaction cost would be large. And I think this is uh, such an important concept. I just wanted to kind of uh, just recap a little bit on what we're saying. So if we go back to the earlier slide, if we put this into, um, you know, real life example, if you had an index strategy with roughly about 10 billion in assets, which are managed against it, most likely that's going to have, you know, lots of different asset managers that are managing those assets. And at the rebalance point for that index, what tends to happen is that each of the uh, asset managers that are going in to do the rebalance will be looking for the same amount, uh, will be looking to buy the same stocks at roughly about the same time. And that has this uh, price pressure which pushes up the prices for those stocks as the demand for it increases. And they have to trade at the higher price. It's not that they get to buy it at the lower price and then the price appreciates. Prices appreciates, then they get to buy it. And a few days later, those prices then revert back down. And that's really where that market impact cost comes in. Now, we also uh, are aware, and I think I, what I quite like about this, this alternative sanity check is that not all... Um, index strategy creators provide the market impact cost assessment for their strategies. So for investors um, you know, that are interested in trying to get a rough sense of whether the, the strategy they're assessing is going to be expensive or, or cheap from an impact perspective, you know, these three uh, quite easily available uh, metrics of annual turnover, average weight of market cap, and number of holdings will give you that kind of rough proxy for whether this is a well-designed strategy that's going to be low impact cost or uh, alternatively a uh, pretty high market impact cost type of strategy. Thank you, Joe. And uh, this is actually a very good segue into the next section of, um, of our webinar where we'll talk about what are some of the design techniques uh, that are associated with better or worse implementation characteristics. And the first element that I want to focus on is waiting schemes. Let's examine three uh, groups of waiting schemes. The first one is market cap. Uh, the, other, uh, the two other ones, uh, one is fundamental waiting. And then third one, I'll group the equal weighted, equal risk weighted and max decorrelation, uh, maximum decorrelation scheme into one bucket. 
and market cap weighting is mm, has very interesting features uh, as a weighting scheme uh, because first it weights proportional to um, to the uh, market size uh, and so larger companies with larger daily volume uh, will consume larger weight in this portfolio um, also because cap weight is linked to price as price goes up uh, the cap weight automatically adjust and you don't need to turn over your portfolio to keep the market cap uh, weighting scheme. Also, that last feature comes at a cost uh, because uh, if, let's say, you allow some mispricing and um, some stocks get uh, overpriced, uh, then these stocks will automatic automatically will be overweighted in the cap-weighted portfolio. Uh, on the opposite side, if a stock get underpriced, it will get underweighted. And uh, we know uh, that uh, there is, over long periods of time, there is mean reversion in prices, and so that results in a return drag uh, to the portfolio performance. Uh, the other th uh, two s groups of scheme, weighting schemes don't necessarily have that last feature. So um, equal weighted or equally risk weighted or max correlation, fundamental weighted, uh, all of these weighting schemes uh, reduce that a return drag because they don't link the weight with price. And now, uh, when we're looking at um, fundamental weighting scheme, uh, it would still uh, allocate uh, larger weight uh, to larger companies. And so the weighted average market cap would be larger. And so uh, in this sense, uh, the uh, fundamental weighted and market cap weighted strategies are quite similar. Um, and uh, e the other three schemes, equal weighting, equal risk, and max decorrelation, don't have this benefit. Uh, also, uh, these uh, non-market cap weighted techniques, uh, they, uh, they do require some level of turnover to maintain the weight, uh, but uh, that comes with the benefit of uh, not having that return drag from overweighting over price stocks and un underweighting under price stocks. And as you uh, look at the performance, so here on the slide, we've uh, replicated a few strategies and all we did was vary the weighting scheme. Uh, and you can see that cap weighting tends to be uh, an outlier with the uh, worst performance um, pretty much universally, uh, whereas the other ones tend to outperform. Yet, when looking at trading costs, uh, the cap weighting scheme tend to be uh, the most attractive. A fundamental weighting scheme uh, tends to be a little bit higher, but actually not that much worse. Uh, and uh, the other weighting schemes uh, tend to be the largest in transaction costs, exactly because they're missing uh, the company size and they may have mm, quite a bit of additional turnover coming from maintaining, let's say, uh, equal uh, risking or maximum decorrelation characteristics of the portfolio. Now, uh, weighting is not the only way to reduce turnover. Um, thoughtful design to control transaction costs around turnover uh, is beneficial. And so one way to do it is to implement turn explicit turnover control. Um, and the benefit of that is um, you, uh, so in, in uh, without this uh, turnover control, um, also known as bending sometimes, uh, you end up turning over portfolio quite frequently with not material impact uh, on the uh, desired characteristics. So, for example, uh, if we're managing value portfolio and there is some kind of threshold, uh, so stocks around threshold, uh, uh, if it falls just, it was value stock, but it now below, a little bit below that threshold, just... Uh, selling it and buying some other that have moved just a little bit above threshold will not change the portfolio char value characteristics all that much. But we will experience the uh, cost from turnover. Um, so if, for example, if we were to focus just on the 10% of these uh, trades uh, away from, uh, from the thresholds which are going to uh, move the needle... Uh, we will uh, still maintain more or less the same value characteristics, but will experience materially lower turnover. Similarly, uh, an another technique, um, momentum filtering, can further improve uh, the turnover characteristics because uh, you don't need to trade all of the trades implied by the signal uh, if they're trading against momentum. Uh, because 
uh, we know, for example, that value tends to uh, buy what has fallen in prices. But in the short run, that's actually dangerous because we're trying to catch the falling knife and uh, that negative momentum tends to persist. Or on the opposite side, it tends to um, sell uh, w- uh, to what has risen up in prices. Uh, but again, uh, qu- quickly selling these recent uh, winners is counterproductive because um, and they continue outperforming in, in the few months uh, following uh, the great recent performance. So uh, using momentum to stop a few trades uh, actually results in improvement in turnover uh, and uh, improvements in return characteristics. So uh, at the bottom, uh, we're showing uh, the outcome of this, applying some of these techniques, of these two techniques. Uh, you can see that without the two uh, techniques, the turnover is about 37% and the estimated transaction costs are about 19 basis points. Applying these two uh, elements of design, uh, we can approximately half the turnover and approximately half the transaction costs uh, without materially impacting the um, portfolio characteristics. And I think, you know, another important point uh, and something worth mentioning about using these smart techniques is it also gives quite a lot of flexibility in the design of a factor portfolio. So, for instance, you know, when creating a, a value factor portfolio, you know, having these smart techniques which are incorporated allows us to be able to be much more selective on the cheapest companies when we are selecting the stock for the portfolio. So normally, you know, we'd probably have to select the top 50% of the cheapest companies to create a value factor. But given that we have so much more capacity and liquidity built in, we can be more selective and select the top 25%, which gives you a much more effective uh, um, factor strategy. Again, a very good point, Joe. Um, and further, it allows to improve momentum characteristics, uh, which where momentum is generally a little bit hard to mm, blend into portfolio because of its high turnover. Um, now, uh, these were techniques to uh, improve transaction costs, but equally important is not to do mistakes and bring in not to bring in the unnecessary turnover. Uh, and just to illustrate that point. Um, consider value strategy. Well, uh, value ben- is a um, benefiting from a longer term mean reversion. But you can implement value strategy um, as rebalanced monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, or annually. Um, and so here uh, on uh, on the slide, we are showing the performance, uh, the annual return, the blue bar, and the uh, annual volatility, the gray bar. And you can see that going from monthly to quarterly to semi-annual to annual, the performance is about the same. In fact, there is a little bit of improvement going from monthly to annual um, because it's very hard to see. You have to squeak your eye, squeeze your eyes quite hard to see that, but it is there. And that benefit comes from um, not trading against momentum uh, when you're doing the annual rebalancing. Now, that's a tiny benefit, though. The real benefit comes from reduction in turnover. So when the strategy is rebalanced monthly, the transaction costs are above 40%. When we go to annual rebalancing, uh, the turnover drops to single teens. And so this four, about four times reduction in turnover uh, is material and it doesn't come at a cost of worse performance. Uh, now. So uh, that the, the lesson from that is that uh, the uh, slower balance strat- uh, signals like value or low volatility low ba- uh, or quality, for example, they don't require frequent turnover. And so going to annual rebalancing is all you need. Now, also, uh, when choosing that rebalancing uh, frequency on, on the next slide, we see uh, the that well, you can uh, implement that rebalancing, let's say, in March, in June, in September, in December. Uh, when we re- rebalance uh, some of the strategies, in the short run, can actually uh, result in quite big difference in performance. Um, and so do we believe that uh, value should be rebalanced in June? No, I think value rebalance in September, or December, or March should give about the same performance. And, and so... Uh, to avoid uh, some of these uh, short-term risks of um, choosing a single rebalancing date, uh, 
so one way of doing it is just why don't we uh, just break the portfolio into four equal tranches uh, where first portfolio is rebalanced in March, second tranche is rebalanced in June, third one is rebalanced in September, September and the fourth one is re rebalanced in December. That dollar weight averages through this uh, potential differences, short-term differences in, in performance and gives a uh, nicer uh, investor experience. Interestingly, it has an even more, uh, an even stronger benefit uh, where now uh, by breaking the portfolio into these four tranches, and we call it quarterly staggered rebalancing uh, technique for portfolio, uh, we are essentially at any moment in time experience only 25% of index portfolio turnover. A and by doing it, we are lowering uh, the transaction cost by about a quarter because at each moment in time, we're consuming just one-fourth uh, of the daily volume. So the price impact becomes one-fourth of what it would have been otherwise. So... These were uh, the uh, techniques and some of the uh, elements of design uh, that index providers can do. Uh, but there are also a few things that I implementers can do uh, when it comes to multi-factor. Uh, and one thing is uh, which factors to choose. So the, And this is a pretty important question. And transaction costs come actually uh, quite uh, very frequently up in, in this uh, consideration. So let's say uh, we're looking at, at five factors. So uh, value, low beta, profitability, investment, and momentum. And they all outperform, right? So here we're showing the um, return, uh, volatility, sharp ratio, and information ratio. And you can see that uh, all of them outperform the market which is nice. That's why investors would want to invest into this. Uh, by the way, uh, this uh, is based on the research that my colleagues Feifi Lee and Joseph Shim done uh, quite recently, and uh, their article is uh, showing up in, uh, is going to show up in Journal of Portfolio M Management uh, quite soon, so I definitely recommend you go and look it up. Um, and this performance, this high performance then would uh, suggest that we should uh, just equal weight uh, allocating to these factors and would be good. But what about costs? Oh, when we are looking at the costs, uh, now what we see is that uh, momentum is a big outlier in terms of trading costs. And so if we assume uh, that the strategy is going to collect quite a bit of assets, well, the transaction costs are going to be larger than the alpha that we saw in the previous page, and so maybe in, we should not include uh, momentum. And many investors are tempted not to include momentum uh, into their strategies. But what about uh, the uh, combination of factors? Um, because when we combine uh, one thing is to look at standalone strategy uh, the other is to look at the uh, these strategies uh, these factors co being combined together uh, and that combination has a benefit where the trades can cancel each other out uh, and so on this slide we show the performance of just four factors excluding momentum and then uh, five factors including momentum and you can see that the two strategies have about the same uh, value added. Now, when we uh, improve, uh, when we include momentum, uh, we see uh, quite similar sharp ratios, and those sharp ratios are about the same if we control, if we don't control for transaction cost. But we also see uh, quite an improvement in information ratio, and that improvement in information ratio comes from two sources. Uh, one is uh, the transaction cost, so you can see that this information ratio stays higher even after we control for transaction cost. And the reason why uh, is because many of the trades cancel each other out, and so uh, that momentum alpha now does benefit our portfolio. Furthermore, uh, momentum signal tends to be uh, quite negatively correlated with value-oriented signal. Uh, and uh, and therefore it imp uh, lowers tracking error and, and improves the information ratio that way. So net-net, uh, uh, when we're looking at the uh, 
uh, multi-factor portfolio, adding momentum ends up uh, being quite beneficial. So Vitaly, I really like this research because quite often, you know, I can't tell you the number of times when I meet with investors and they often talk about how they're a bit uncertain about momentum, they want to exclude it when they're thinking about a multi-factor program. And um, a lot of the reason for that is that over the last 15 years or so, momentum has done terribly, so it doesn't look as good as the other factors historically, uh, but also because they view it as very expensive and high turnover. And so what I like about the results here is that it really shows that when you include it in that multi-factor framework is the netting benefits uh, works out very well where you don't actually have that much additional cost, but then you get that huge reduction in the tracking error. Good point. And further, it brings the benefit of a smoother ride coming from diversification between factors. Well, in the end, let me offer a few concluding remarks. First, Trading costs are material, uh, and index implementation is a very important issue. Uh, transaction costs for index funds can be quite high. Also, uh, these costs tend to be hidden, uh, and therefore investors need to pay very close attention to how the indices are constructed. Now, the good news uh, is that high transaction cost is not a destiny. So. Uh, thoughtful implementation design can mitigate transaction cost and, and using weighting schemes uh, that promote liquidity can improve transaction cost characteristics. Further, uh, employing, uh, employing turnover control mechanisms uh, can uh, further reduce transaction costs. And then finally, uh, employing uh, various techniques around uh, how to execute these trades, like staggered rebalancing, uh, can further improve the after-cost investor experience. Uh, and then as investors are thinking of uh, their own choices, um, it's tempting to... Uh, not to include certain factors because of the higher transaction cost, but uh, it's important to uh, observe portfolio holistically and notice that trades can cancel each other out. And so uh, from that perspective, for example, momentum trades particularly tends to cancel each other out with other more contrarian uh, type of trades. And therefore, uh, the net benefit for the investor is positive from including momentum portfolio, momentum factor into portfolio even after we account for transaction costs. Great. Thanks, Vitaly. That was really, uh, really great uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted to touch on a few questions. Um, we had some feedback from the previous webinars that we didn't give enough uh, time for questions. So I just wanted to make sure that we give a little bit more uh, in today. So uh, apologies if we go over time a little bit, but I think this is quite uh, uh, useful for, for those who are listening on, uh, on the webinar. So one question we have is... For the low beta estimated costs, uh, can you say anything around how efficient each of those strategies are at reducing uh, volatility? Uh, does the higher cost justify, is it justified uh, by having more risk reduction? Um, the element uh, of the design uh, that moves the needle the most in terms of uh, reduction of beta and volatility uh, comes from selection. So uh, weighting scheme can further improve uh, the uh, volatility, but it doesn't move the needle nearly as much. Uh, yet uh, the uh, trading costs differences are uh, the most material coming from differences in the weighting schemes. Uh, and so uh, from that trade-off perspective, uh, I think it's better, so if you do want that a higher reduction in, um, that higher reduction in volatility, it's better to, to have a slightly more concentrated portfolio in low beta stocks, but still focus on um, capturing the, uh, in reducing t low turnover and in, in introducing the higher weighted average market cap to improve the implementation characteristics. And uh, so we have another question. Uh, why not apply the momentum filtering in the the RAFI fundamental strategies? Uh, we have uh, estimated uh, the transaction cost for our RAFI fundamental strategies. And uh, those without uh, momentum filtering, 
uh, tend to be uh, on the order of hundreds, multiple hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and therefore, um, and that just comes naturally uh, from the index, uh, from the low turnover nature of fundamental, uh, of using fundamental weights to select and weight companies. Uh, and therefore, um, it's it's just not necessary. It's just an unnecessary uh, complication to the process. And then there's a question on the momentum factor. So when you were talking about rebalancing, uh, you mentioned that annual rebalancing helps to reduce the turnover. But how do you tie that up with momentum? Would you recommend that you only annually rebalance the momentum factor? Momentum is a short-lived signal. It tends to run uh, on the order of uh, a few months to a year. Uh, and uh, by uh, going to annual frequency of rebalancing momentum uh, actually uh, removes quite a bit of benefit from momentum. Uh, and uh, so one way uh, of doing it is, let's say, uh, mixing uh, the uh, momentum uh, signal uh, momentum factor, which is rebalanced, let's say, in quarterly uh, cycle, uh, with otherwise quarterly staggered rebalancing portfolio for other factors. And so uh, we are getting uh, essentially the same benefits of trades crossing, uh, and yet we can go to higher frequency of rebalancing momentum portfolio. All right. And I think we, let's just do one last question uh, before we wrap up. Uh, this is quite an interesting one. Uh, can you use market impact cost model on quant managers that are not uh, indexing their strategies? Uh, you could. And um, so the one thing, uh, one difference um, that you produ produces uh, is, well, uh, when it comes to active implementation, active implementation have uh, has some advantages and has some disadvantages. So one uh, advantage that active implementation does uh, has is you have uh, flexibility of spreading trades over time, hiding trades, and so that improves the performance characteristics for active managers. Now, at the same time, uh, index has a benefit uh, where essentially index rebalancing is close to public information. So. Uh, when uh, other market participants uh, observe an uh, index trade coming um, coming up, uh, they know that this information uh, that there is no information content in these trades, and, and therefore uh, you see that linear uh, result, uh, linear uh, impact uh, between ADV and uh, and the transaction cost and the price impact. Now uh, that's not necessarily true when it comes to active managers because if active managers uh, were to trade and uh, and the other market participants don't know where this trade is coming from, they would uh, automatically assume that there is some information content, potentially they're trading with, versus someone with private information. And therefore, uh, the trading cost for active trades uh, may be uh, larger. Um, and so in that sense, um, the same models uh, are not necessarily uh, applicable or need uh, recalibration uh, to be applied to active managers. Great. Well, uh, that's uh, all we actually have time for uh, today. So I just wanted to thank everyone again for joining today's webinar. I hope you've all found it very useful. Um, if you don't mind, there's a very short uh, survey uh, after this. If you could give us your feedback, it's really important for us to continue uh, improving uh, upon the delivery of these webinars going forward. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.